Welcome to the Massage Hodge podcast. My name is Nick Paterka, a licensed massage therapist in Portland, Oregon. I am joined today by Sean Kitzman, a fellow practitioner and movement coach and wellness and healthcare coach, helping people with their businesses in Minnesota. Welcome oh, yeah. to the show. Thanks, man. I I'm, I I apologize for screwing up on Friday, and I'm glad that I could get to be here today oh, sh- and chat with you a bit. I uh, I'm working my way through the states, and I got inundated with people. So now I'm just I have lots of episodes coming up, and I get that. Can we just appreciate the fact that we both have perfect haircuts? Well, I mean, I mean, if you're you listening, know, you can't you don't understand that neither of us have hair. Yeah, I mean, like everybody's <laughs> complaining about not going to the barber. I was I was just in the shower this morning before I went, and the the barber came to me and my razor and my shaving cream. You know? Yeah, it's kind yeah. of uh, it's kind of perfect. So it, okay. well, it, it is. I mean, because the the smartest guys in the face of the planet are bald guys, anyways. I mean, you know, yeah, like yeah. if we're honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before I begin, uh, well, before we talk about Minnesota, I should say, mm-hmm. um, I usually get a little origin story as to how you came to the massage and body work world. If you cool. could give us a little comic book number one. Sure. So the Reader's Digest condensed version, please. Is um, so. I had, uh, he's since passed, but I had a very eccentric uncle. Uh, I'm originally from Michigan. My uncle lived in Connecticut. Uh, well, he was from Michigan, but moved to Connecticut. And he was an, uh, he was an engineer. Um, he worked for General Dynamics, helped them like develop lasers for, the, for nuke subs. When I remember uncle, he, Jimmy brought LEDs uh, back home when he came on vacation one day in like 1989. And he was like, oh. these things are going to be amazing. Just wait. And I'm like, 13 years old. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Like, what are you talking about? You know, because it was LEDs. And lo and behold, of course, he was right. But anyways, um, when he moved to Connecticut, well, he was always a really active guy. He did yoga in like the 70s and was doing Tai Chi. Um, and he told me about Rolfing uh, in, the, in the 80s. So my first introduction to the idea of massage or body work was from my uncle who was getting rolfed. Uh, th- and he told me that rolfing helped him hike because he would go on, on hikes. He would mountain bike and play handball and kayak and all of these things. He was a very outdoor active guy. Um, he's like, yeah, I, I see this lady, uh, or maybe, maybe it was a guy. Anyways, I see this guy, this rolfer in, in Connecticut, man. And, and again, I'm like 14. I'm like, I don't, I don't care, Jim. Like, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> and he would have us sit, like, he would have us sit and do, like, um, he took chi- He took uh, Tai Chi from this Tai Chi instructor that I think had, like, pretty quick lineage back to China because they taught pushing hands and, like, a very kind of martial aspect of Tai Chi. But he would have us sit and do, like, the do-in, all the tapping, and we're, I'm, like, 12, 13 years old, pounding on my head, and I'm, like, what am I doing? Like, this is bananas. And so Jimmy was my first introduction. And my dad, uh, my dad is a very physically affectionate person. So I have a younger brother. Um, and so Sunday morning, my brother and I would wake up. My dad would pretend like he was sleeping. My mom would leave the room because she knew what was going to happen, which meant that my brother and I would run into my parents' bed. We would jump on my dad. We would wrestle for a bit. When we would start to get spun out of control and, you know, get a little bit too far, if you have young kids, you kind of understand, like, there's this this, this really interesting, like, like switch that happens when you roughhouse with them. And so what he would do is then he would, like, go, okay, now it's massage time. And he would massage our heads and massage our backs, and it would calm us down. And uh, so, yeah, I have two boys, was, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. this really <laughs> fine line, right? Where they go from like controlled to like like Tasmanian devils, but it becomes like relatively safe and then not safe, right? Or, yeah. or, or relatively it's fun and then it's not fun, right? Yeah. Which, by the way, I think that's a really important lesson for everybody to learn, but particularly boys, right? I mean, mm-hmm. so it was a really, he did a really good job of kind of like teaching us these boundaries of things. And then he would use this massage to calm us down. And when I was about 12 or 13, he, he threw out his back um, and he would see a Cairo. Uh, and we were introduced to the idea of like, like ice massage. So we would put, you know, um, uh, water in the Dixie cup. Mm-hmm. And we put it in the freezer. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about the Dixie cup is you can just peel it off yeah. as you go down. 
And so I would give, I would give him ice massage when he hurt, hurt his back. And then like we used rolling pins and, you know, the, you know, I mean, I wasn't licensed by the way. So, you know, please don't throw me in jail at 14. Um, so, um, so, you know, like we use these things and we found that he actually got better quicker when we did this. So fast forward, uh, I'm done with high school. I have no idea what I want, what I want to do. I just know I suck at school in general. I got a GED. I, I just, I went all four years. I, I just wasn't engaged in any of the topics. Right. And so, um, I was a credit and a half short, uh, I went to take my GED the day uh, when I, after I got out of high school. And I said to the lady, I said, uh, I'm here to take my GED. She goes, okay. And she gives me one test booklet. I said, there's two. I want them both. And she said, no, you take it two days in a row. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm going to do it in one day. She goes, nobody does that. I said, I will. Trust me. So I took, I, I took two tests in one day and I passed and I didn't go back. <laughs> and my, my mom said to me, she goes, you know, you really like athletics and you really like kids you should, and PT was now this, this really quickly developing field, right? Yeah. So you think of PT as this hundreds of year old field, and it's not if you do the research on it. It's, it's a very, very new field, although, you know, we act like they're experts. And so, so I'm like, mom, I didn't get out of high school. What in the hell makes you think I'm going to get through four years of college? Because at that time, it was like a, like kind of a certificate, like, bachelor, you know, degree, it wasn't like a master's yet, or because we're talking mid 90s, right? 94. Okay. And so um, I went, I looked up because then I had this idea of going to massage school, because I knew somebody that was going to massage school. So in Michigan, this, there was two schools at the time, and there was a third one opening. Um, but you know, this is pre internet, this is pre like, w the World Wide web was on a phone and a modem that yeah. made crazy noises that nobody like, four I remember people it well. Yeah, the four people on the face of the planet knew what the hell it was. I remember the first time I went over to my buddy's house who went to Michigan for a computer science degree. You know, yeah. he, he's like, watch this. And he puts his phone on the modem. You know, I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, we can talk to people from all over the world. I'm like, seven of you nerds in your mom's basement? You know? <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, when you found out stuff, you went to the yellow pages. Because that's, that's where your information was, typically. So the closest massage school to me when I started to research it was like 40 minutes away. And then there was another one that was an hour and a half away. And I was 18. I'm like, well, that sounds like way too much effort to me. And so, um, so I started studying martial arts in 1992. And um, one of the martial arts I studied uh, and I became an instructor in is the art of Jeet Kune Do, which is the art that Bruce Lee developed. And Bruce Lee's top, one of Bruce Lee's top students that kind of has taken on that mantle and, and teaches in seminars, his name is Dan Asano. Dan Asano is Filipino-American, first-generation Filipino-American. He'll be 84 this summer sometime. And in 97, I was, in a, I was at a seminar, and uh, your Dan says, you know, if you guys really want to understand martial arts, you should probably look into the healing arts as well. He said, I had a lot of the, the old Filipino guys that I taught, that I learned from that were really good at, you know, body work and uh, things like that. And he said, I really regret not learning it now. And so I thought, oh, well, I had already been thinking about it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I was working grocery retail at the time. And I said, well, if I ever get crabby, because I saw a lot of people get crabby in grocery retail. I said, if I ever get crabby, um, maybe I'll go to massage school. So that was May of 97. In September of 97, I went to school. So I got crabby in the four months or whatever it was. <laughs> and, um, and then I got out of school. I lived in a really small conservative community. Um, there wasn't massage envy. Um, you know, there was no franchises at the time. You know, when you're in a town of like seven to 10,000 people, there's not a lot of people that are, have a massage practice open. Fewer of them, fewer of them actually want to hire a 22-year-old guy if you can't tell, I'm a tad type A, I'm a tad extroverted, and I'm a tad intense. Now, remember, I'm 44 now. This is a highly refined version of what I was at 22. <laughs> so, so like nobody wanted to hire me, really, you know? And so I didn't know what to do. Uh, I spent three years lawn mowing and then bouncing around between different jobs, living on people's couches, you know, what you do when you're kind of 21, 22 years old. And then in 90, uh, yeah, let's see, in, in 2000, uh, I had the worst day lawn mowing because it was 95 degrees with a million degrees relative humidity. We were out landscaping. 
like it was digging in the in the clay wet clay it sucked i just was not into it any longer and i was like yeah. i'm done i'm gonna find a different job so i i looked in the newspaper because that's where you look for jobs before <laughs> linkedin there was this thing called the newspaper i looked in the newspaper and a, and a chiropractor um was looking for a massage therapist so he hi, i went i called they had me come in same day for an interview he hired me there and i started the next day i worked for him for about nine months um, and then in between that time, I worked. Uh, I also hired in at a private practice, massage practice in a uh, racket club mm. or a tennis club. Um, and I worked. I worked for the chiropractor for nine months, and I worked for that lady. I kind of apprenticed underneath her um, for uh, three years. And so, you know, I mean, we can kind of go forth from there. But that's my. That's kind of my yeah. journey to massage. Yeah, that's that's quite a journey. So work work uh, jobs until you get too crabby, and then yep. Move on. <laughs> yep, yeah, until you hate your life more than you're willing to to say. Yeah. Oh, I hate yeah, it. And once I you found it. massage, you found you found your little uh, your groove to stick with. Although, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, because the, the thing it was is I loved to pro- I loved to solve problems, and in both of the environments that I was in, solving problems was a premium. Like that was something that you know people valued. Yeah. And so I, I tried to do relaxation massage. Um, I lied to myself for about three years and thought that, man, if I just do one more this way, I'll be good at it. And I was never good at it. I sucked. Yeah. I was really bad at it. And so, um, and I think it's a valuable skill, by the way. Like, I think that I'm, I'm envious of people that can take people into a room and give them this nice, relaxing, tranquil experience. That I do quite a bit of that, actually. Yeah, there's no way in hell I could do it. The only way I can knock someone out is if I hit him in the head with a two by four. I mean, like, I just, there's no <laughs> I way. I gotta be honest, Sen- I, sensing your energy, I, I, I fully believe you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, like, I, tr- I'm, cause I, I'm no stranger to like, like working to get good at something. Yeah. And damn it, if I didn't try, like, I tried like hard. Bit? Do you like, are you, can you calm down and receive that type of work? Love it. Okay. I love it. That's why I see the value in it. Because yeah. it takes me, it takes me at a you know a little bit more of a beta state, right, and then puts me down or a high alpha state, sorry, and then puts me more into like a beta brainwave state. Like it, it slows me down quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, I love it. I think it's extremely, extremely valuable and extremely, extremely important. I'm um, glad. I'm kind of glad to hear you say that. I feel like there's there can be a little bit of like oh, it's the worst. Uh, just yeah. like people yeah. on one side going like, ugh, relaxation massages is like what a waste of time. And then like the other end being like the woo-woo side being like, well, you guys are too intense over there. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so I really I, see value on both sides. Yeah. I think that the thing that people forget about is a good manual therapist. I don't care if it's a chiropractor. I don't care if it's a massage therapist. I don't care if it's an osteo, a physio, a massage therapist. The good ones are the ones who can downregulate the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system well enough so that the client's brain feels safe enough to make changes. Yeah, there you go. Look, I don't give a shit how much ART you do or deep tissue or or grass thin or whatever, you know, run them over with a with a uh, a lawnmower. Like I don't care what it is that you do. If you don't understand how to how if you don't understand that the brain is m- far more important than tissue, then you're just running yourself into you're not actually getting anywhere with your clients. You're just making them sore, you're inflaming the area. So that was when I was at school the reason why I tried so hard at it was because they really, I went to a health enrichment center in Lapeer, which is where Sandy Fritz, Sandy Fritz taught uh, that that was her school. Wow. So um, yeah, it's really funny. Cause I, when I was in school, um, everybody was afraid of Sandy and I liked Sandy. Um, Cause I wasn't afraid of Sandy. I'm like, Sandy puts on her pants the same way I do, you know, like, <laughs> you know, but Sandy's this really type A personality. And I'm very polarizing as well, right? Hmm. So, um, so anyways, like they taught us, they had two, they had two tracks. You could go through like subtle energies, or you could go down like kind of what they called like an advanced clinical route. But they would tell you, look, at the end, you're going to arrive at the same place, hmm. right? So, so if you if you know what what do subtle energies do really well? They they calm down the central and the autonomic nervous system right? Like if you're with a good practitioner, that's what happens. The change happens when those two things are, are, are in alignment and the brain feels safe and the client feels safe. And so they did a really good job. I was the last thousand hour hands-on program in the state of Michigan. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there was a, it was a, 
I think it's really important. I think it's extremely valuable. And I, and I agree with you and I'm, and I get really upset and frustrated with people who are like, Oh, that relaxation stuff, blah, blah, or I don't yeah. want to be that. Yeah. You know? Okay. Oh, so, um, let's jump over. Now this is, um, sort of a short conversation about yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. I've been talking to people about the requirements for different States. Uh, mm -hmm. all States have different requirements. And so give us the skinny on becoming a practitioner in Minnesota. Yeah, so it's um, it's a certif certification state, so there's no licensure. Um, sometimes, you know, towns or cities will have license that you will be licensed through that. Um, yeah. And some towns and cities are really tough with it, and then other ones are really lax with it. So what you find is certain towns and cities don't have a lot of massage therapists, and mm -hmm. other ones do. I mean, it's 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 capitalism. I mean, like that's yeah. that's exactly what happens, and so. Um, and all that to say, there's very few hurdles to clear to become like yeah. someone off the street, no experience with body work, massage. They could ostensibly start a practice and just like read a book about it and watch sure. it. Sure, but but they, if we're gonna be yeah, but if we're gonna be honest, they can do that anywhere. They I mean, could, yes, I understand. Yeah, I mean, but if we're gonna be, there's no like, there's no, there's no, no, no regulation. There's no licensure. No. There's no system no. set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yep. No enforcement. And that was and the way, so, like, we, like we talked about it before we got on, that was the way Michigan was for the first probably 12 or 13 years of my career. Okay. And then what do you see as sort of the good and the bad in that? Does it, how, does it affect the culture there in terms of getting body work? Or is, no. Yeah. No. I mean, because it didn't affect the body work, the culture in Michigan when I was there either. I mean, you know, like, like the, the funny thing about it is, and so my wife is a nurse practitioner and nurse midwife. And I think that the, the, the closest that you can get in the healthcare community to massage therapists is, is nurses because it, it, each state is individually licensed. Right. Okay, so yeah. um, the reason now the difference with that is, is that's in their base. It's, it's paid via insurance. Right. I mean, like, so when you're at a hospital, the hospital generates the revenue via the insurance industry. Right. So, um, and obviously they make life and death, death decisions. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. like if you're an ER nurse, you're making life and death decisions. I've made a lot of decisions in my career in 20 years. I've never made a life and death decision in my, in my career. And maybe on occasion someone does because someone has a heart attack or a stroke and but it's that, you know, I mean, it's not like they, it happens all the time. So, um, so I think that I don't personally see and people are going to hate me for this when I say this and I'm okay with it. Right. I don't see any benefit to the, the licensure or, or that regulation, because if you look at the States where it's, if you look at the state, I know a lot of people in States that are highly regulated. They're actually leaving the industry because of it, because they've gotten to a place in their practice where they're like, Oh, well, massage is only a piece of the tool of the toolbox. If you're really going to look at working on people, and so now you highly regulate me and, and I can't perform what I want to get done. So, you know, now I have to go to school to be a PT to, to suggest someone does a doorway stretch or I have to get a personal tra trainer certification. Like, like, and I mean, so I, I, I don't see personally myself because it, so shortly after massa license, massage was licensed in Michigan, the small town that I was living in before we moved here, they're opened up an Asian massage parlor, you know? Mm. Well, obviously they went through the board and, and the board, you know, they, I, it, it happened before and it happened after look at Chicago. It happens all the time, which is a highly, highly regulated state. So mm -hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't see, I'm just not a, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I hadn't heard about the, like running up against the scope of practice. Uh -huh. Yeah. That, that would be, challenging and, and limiting I, I haven't really been asking about the the different different states have different scopes like some some places you can advise stretches as a massage therapist and some places you can't yeah and the funny thing about it is i've been in, i've been in practice for 20 years i've never had the scope of practice please knock on my door and i don't know anybody that's ever had the scope of practice please knock on their door because you know why nobody gives a shit <laughs> all it was 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 for in order for us to get this license that made us credible right we had to jump through hoops with the board, uh, the state board. And the state board is going to be chiropractors and physical therapists and doctors, osteos, right? And, and ortho surgeons that what are they going to do? They're going to try and keep you out of their pocket as much as they possibly can. If you don't believe me, ask a chiro 
who is, you know, a Cairo in the 60s, when they could adjust everything. And then in certain states where they got licensed, then they can they could no longer adjust extremities. Mm. Right? So yeah. because they wanted to jump into the, the 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 cesspool of the insurance industry, what happened? They limited their scope of practice. They limited their their ability to be effective for their patients. Yeah. So yeah. You're saying. Well, uh, before we move on from Minnesota, I feel like you should tell people what a juicy Lucy is. Oh, a juicy Lucy is a <laughs> is a hamburger with cheese cooked in the middle of it. Wow. I guess it's, I gotta say I kind of want to try one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. They love them here, but they like tater tot casserole here too, by the way, which they call hot dish. Right. Hot dish. Yep. Hot dish, which hot is dish. essentially what I, it's like a goulash of tater tots. Like whatever you have in the cupboard, throw some tater tots in there in a casserole dish and just toss it in the oven for, you know, an indeterminate amount of time until the tater tots are, are brown and crispy. And then uh, like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty funny thing. The Midwest it's their, their food traditions are great. I'm from Ohio originally. And I oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm really sorry to hear that. <laughs> I, uh, I, um, How spent a lot of you... Wisconsin growing up too. Oh yeah. 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 Where at? In Milwaukee. I have a lot of family from there. Okay. So my cousin lives in Milwaukee. I love Milwaukee. Yeah. It's a great city. Yeah. Yeah. Milwaukee yeah. is awesome. I gotta, I gotta get back there. I go see my mom. Of course, can't go anywhere. Speaking right. of which we can't go anywhere because we're still in the midst of uh, this crisis. Yep. So can you tell me a little bit about how that unfolded in Minnesota and where you're at with that? Yeah. So I think I come at it from two different angles. Um, I come at it from a small business owner and um, as a small business owner for 20 years, um, when they told us it was at the end of uh Uh, it's the end of March. They told us that we, you know, everybody were on the mandatory lockdown or the mandatory stay at home. Mm -hmm. I was actually that Friday, I was going to, uh, I was going to shut my practice down for a couple of weeks just to see what happened. Um, you know, cause I was like, man, you know, I mean, like this, this thing actually looks like it's, it's actually something's happening with this. So I stacked up just a killer week. Like, I mean, I, I was killing it that week. Right. (laughs) And so, um, and then Sunday night or Monday night, I can't remember. Um, around five o'clock, the governor came probably, it was probably Monday. The governor came on and said, you know, we're doing this mandatory shutdown, stay at home. And for about 12 hours, um, I was pissed beyond belief because never in 20 years, I'm 44 years old. I'm, I have the ability to practice. I have the desire to practice. Um, I, I never thought I would be told that I couldn't work when I physically and had the desire to do so. Right. Yeah. And, and so that, that was really tough. And then like, so, I mean, outside of massage, I'm pretty much a moron. Like I, tra- I train martial arts. So I'm either, well, I, a movement coach, like I either help put people back together or I help take people apart. Like that's my, those are my two jobs. Right. Okay. So as, as a jujitsu practitioner, jujitsu is just the art about it's, a, it's the art of subluxation and tearing shit. Right. I mean, that's really kind of what it is. Okay. And, and then, and then, you know, putting someone to see, sleep via choke. Right. So, um, so, you know, like I don't have, I've done this for 20 years. Like I have zero, zero market shit, like appeal. And I'm, and I've been a self-employed business owner for 20 years. I'm the worst employee on the face of the planet. And then where am I going to go? Like pushing carts at Walmart. I did that when I was 14, you know, and I seriously thought like, God, am I going to have to go deliver Uber Eats? Like, You'll get crabby I- real quick doing it. Oh you. yeah. Yeah. For sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, what am I going to do? Deliver Uber Eats? Like, what do I do? And so I woke up the next morning and, and I actually told my wife, my wife was like trying to help me problem solve it out. And I looked at her and I was like, I can't talk to you about this right now. I was like, you just, I, I just, and I, and I don't, I mean, my wife and I, we don't have that type of relationship where I kind of like emotionally shut down. And I emotionally shut down because I had to figure out what I was going to do. And I had to be pissed for quite a bit, right? I had to be pissed for quite a bit. And so the next morning I woke up early and I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do here? Um, So what I decided to do is I was like, okay, well, I've done enough in my practice in the type of work that I do as a, as a kind of a movement re-education coach. Um, I've worked with clients online before. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I, I can do it. Sure. So, um, so I decided, you know, I reached out to some of my clients, like my best clients. I'm like, okay, here's what I'm doing, right? I can't go into practice. Here's what I'm doing. For those of you who want to jump on board, come on with me. For those of you who don't, I understand. Um, 
And so I had some people, you know, jump on board with me and that was cool because it allowed me to generate some revenue. And then I put, I was like, well, you know, this is kind of cool. I'm going to see if I can do this with some of my old clients in Michigan. So my, my Synergy Movement Therapy page, Facebook page has like close to 3000 people that follow it. Mm -hmm. The problem of it is many industry people. Um, and so when I put online, I put like, hey, I'm going to teach a free joint mobility class. That's what I was going to call it, just so everybody had some frame of reference for it. I'm going to teach a free class to the first 20 people, 10 on Tuesday, 10 on Thursday. And then the goal was to upsell them to one-to-one -one sessions. All 20 of those people were my friends from the freaking industry. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, what? I mean, are you serious? Like, I know you bastards aren't going to pay me for anything because I know how the massage industry is. <laughs> we will, we will take, we will like go down the road and find scrap metal before we actually pay for something by ourselves. Right. <laughs> and I was like, what is the deal? And then I started to think about it. I was like, oh, well, all these people know me from continuing education courses. And they know that I typically get, I, I'm ahead of the curve on a lot of things when I do stuff. Mm -hmm. So here's what I thought. I was like, oh, I know what they want to do. They want to see what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I started to look around the landscape of, of uh, the massage industry. And I was like, hmm, nobody's sticking their head up here and like actually wanting to do anything for the industry. Like they're all just stockpiling on the, oh, you know, unemployment and stimulus check and all of these things, right? And what do I do? Because my clients called me, you know, they want to get in all of this complaining stuff. Like nobody was actually providing any solutions. And I'm like, well, I know the two places that massage therapists are going to struggle the most with this. Um, they, we, as an industry, we suck at interviewing clients to help to, to create a system of hierarchies. So then we could take an online platform. We could start to have, we could start to produce outcomes for our clients that were favorable that would make them want to come back. And then second, they suck at visual assessment skills because they don't teach you that stuff in school. Yeah. And I know, I know for the five people that are going to watch this, they're going to go, oh, well, my school did. No, they didn't, I promise you. And here's how I know. I talked to over 300 massage therapists in April. No, they didn't. And I've been around the industry for 20 years. Like, no, they didn't teach you the, they, yes, they taught you this is abduction, adduction, and this is flexion and extension, but they didn't tell you, teach you anything about how the skeleton moves appropriately to eccentrically and concentrically load tissue. Hmm. So I, I, I initially taught that class. Um, and then I'm a moderator on the Massage Entrepreneurs Group website, or on uh, Facebook group, sorry. Sure. And Michael Ortiz, who's another moderator, who's a great guy down in Vegas, he took my class and he was like, this is amazing, right? This was a really good class, the free class. It was 45 minutes. And he put it up on the Massage Entrepreneur Group and then it went from like, you know, 10 people in a class to 30 people in a class for three weeks straight. I was teaching twice a day, seven days a week. Um, and so then I created a free course, uh, I'm sorry, a paid course um, to then take people who wanted to take a step farther with the ideas that I taught in the course. I actually taught a, a loose idea of how you would do this and how you would create hierarchies. Um, so that was all of April for me. And that's, that's, that's all online. That's all. Yep, uh, that's all online. Yep. Yeah. All online. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I created the, the paid course and that was all of April for me. I, and that then that I, result of that is that you would be like this one-to-one -one with the client and then they, or small group. I, I have a, uh, a person that, uh, so when I moved from Michigan to Minnesota in 2016, I left a practice of 16 years. Um, and a friend of mine who was actually an old student of mine, I taught, a, I taught, uh, occupational and sports massage for one semester at a, at a college in Michigan and a friend of mine, Elise Lengel, um, she was in that class and then I've mentored her through her career and she took over my old practice. She's actually teaching, like she does like small, I think she has like six or eight people in a class. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and she teaches a small like group kind of move your body type class. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you could do it either one-to-one -one or you could do it in small groups. And your class would look like, so Maybe in, if this was the class, I would step back. You would ask me to go through some certain movements and you would assess that. And then you yep. would talk me through working on myself. Uh, corrective, cr the actual corrective of it. Okay. Yep. So, so when we get into shoulder flexion, once we get a pat, about past 90, uh, what, what is going to happen is that the scapula should depress mm -hmm. and, and uh, posterior tilt just a little bit. What most people do is they move their humerus on an extended limb and they don't actually move their, their scapula. 
And yeah. so what happens is that the Terry's, the levator, all of those things in there, because you're not loading it well. Yeah. Uh, and if they're not, if they're doing it unloaded, they're sure in the hell doing it loaded. So, um, so yeah, we, we go through, uh, I teach them to, to in the, in the, well, in the, in the class that I created, um, it was four, it was four classes. Uh, the first class was breathing. Um, so we actually teach them how to align the pelvis rib cage and skull and integrate the breath with that. Mm -hmm. Then pelvis, pelvis rib cage and skull and shoulder. And so it's all about the timing and the movement of those things and the assessments of them. And most of the time, if a person can't do the movement, the corrective or the, the therapy is really just teaching them to do that and then integrating that in with another movement. Because okay. if the brain doesn't know that it has the movement, it will use anything else to, to do it. Yeah. And then do the, do the, on the client side, do they need any tools or is they, they can just show up as themselves? And Yep. If they have a head, two arms, two legs, and a spine and can breathe, they can. But they don't need a foam roller or therapeutic massage. No, because they could. So, so the thing that I didn't want to do is I just didn't want to go on YouTube and regurgitate a bunch of shit that people have already taught. Yeah. Right. That, that, by the way, like your average client could find on YouTube. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give a perspective and, and open up the brain a little bit for, for these therapists to a, I don't care if they do my stuff, but if they have a client that comes in and they understand how to assess it better and they want to go back to massage, they're going to have a better idea of what to, what to actually work on. So instead of, so instead of, you know, like client has shoulder pain, they have pain on the anterior side of the shoulder that may or may not be the problem, by the way. Right. Mm -hmm. That's just the thing that the brain is flagging at the mo- moment that's unsafe. Well, how do we assess that? How do we get to like figuring out what we want to release? Yeah. Right. So, so that, that was the thing that I wanted to do. Yeah. Well, it's, it definitely sounds like you found a way to keep, keep yourself busy. Oh man. April was bananas. Yeah. It was bananas. <laughs> it was craziness. I believe it. So, and, so, and what about, what else about Minnesota is, is the state like on, on a reopening st- Plan there. Yeah, yeah, they're they're on this. They're on a reopening, um, and they're it's at a really weird. Um, they haven't said kind of when private practice massage therapists could return. They've said salons and spas, right? Um, which we kind of fall under, I guess, but yeah. not really. You I know mean, what I mean, if a if a if a massage envy is going to be open, surely a private practitioner could be open. Yeah, yeah, but they just haven't given really good oh, okay. guidelines on what it is. And and so I don't care about that per se, but the problem is the general public, right? Yeah. So what you have here in Minnesota is they're really good at following the rules too. They're Scandinavian uh, culture, so they're <laughs> really good at following the rules. Yeah. So, I mean, they will drive 55 miles an hour in the left lane and not get out of the left lane, right? Yeah. So, uh, and I'm from Michigan. We drive 85 in the left lane. Yeah. If the speed limit's 70, right? Like... <laughs> Get the hell out of the way, you know. I mean, yeah. So they're really. So when do you see yourself back in back in action with live clients? Um, I don't know to be completely okay. honest with you. I mean, it's 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 something. So the other issue that I have again is my wife is a nurse pr- practitioner, nurse midwife. Right. So you know, she, she actually had a she has a colleague that was diagnosed this week. So I'm kind of a vector. I see. Um, so yeah. um, yeah. So I don't know. Um. I, I, I have, I have other things that I'm working on anyways to, mm-hmm. to kind of supplement, supplement my income and, yeah. and make it so that if, if, and when something like this happens again, the bottom just doesn't fall out for me. And then I've got to, you know, work my face off for a whole month. So, yeah, it sounds like a lot of us are sort of considering ways to protect ourselves from future pandemics or future whatever yeah yeah i mean i think that's just good business anyways right i mean yeah yeah i just have never i've i've flirted around with the idea um because for me I, again my practice was in michigan in the mid, mid to late 2000s we started to see the recession in 2005 and it didn't end until 2012 in michigan from mm-hmm. 2008 to 2012 we had double digit unemployment i understand all about what this is and i understand all about what the landscape is going to look like economically like for the people who think that they're going to go back into practice and their practice is going to be just as happy and cheery and all their clients are coming back in you need to get your head out of the sand because that's not going to be the way it is right yeah. there's been so many people that have either lost an exorbitant amount of money or you know they're not they don't have a job any longer 
And, and the more you get away from city centers, like from big cities, here in Minneapolis will be fine because Minneapolis, ironically, um, has 16 Fortune 500 companies in, mm-hmm. in the Twin Cities. So, I mean, it's a very diverse economy. Yeah. And it's very, uh, it's, it's very, for the landscape, there's 3 million people between the Twin Cities. And so you have a very diverse economy with a, a, a lot of highly educated people. And yeah. so um, we'll be okay. But if you get 50 miles outside of Minneapolis and you're in a little small town of 12,000 people, they're not going to be okay. It's going to be different. Yeah, for sure. So while, while I have you here, since you have such a, a sort of a storied career uh, and you've been at it for so long, I'd love to ask you about longevity as a therapist. Sure. How do you, how do you think about that? What do you think is the... What goes into to being able to do this work for a long time? Well, I think you have. I think there's a couple things. Um, I think you have to find a passion and and really dive into it. Um, luckily, the blessing and curse of my personality is I either like something or I don't. Mm. So there's no like there's no in between. Um, and so uh, I can't. When my wife and I started dating, I'm like, look, I'm always going to be self employed. I'm always going to figure out a way to make money and it's going to be a way to make money doing stuff that I love to do. Cause I can't do anything else. I can't be a miserable person like that. Right. Yeah. So I think that you have to, and, and I also think that like, you know, my first eight to 10, eight years, really, I was my, my probably my first six or seven years. I really liked doing massage. I was really passionate about it. I liked, but I, I what I, I really was passionate about was I liked the learning the skill of massage. Mm-hmm. So, so long as I can continue to learn, I'm happy. Yeah. Once I hit a, once I hit a window where the, the, my idea of what my outcomes should be, and then the learning curve, um, when the learning curve starts to, to, to plateau off, then I start to become, you know, a little ADD and squirrely, and I got to figure out the next challenge to solve for myself. And yeah. so I think that that passion is really part of it. The other thing is I think that most... Mm-hmm. I'm going to make a lot of people mad again. Um, <laughs> most massage therapists don't take care of themselves, right? Okay. I mean, look, an athletic event shouldn't be walking across your parking lot with a basket full of sheets, yeah. right? Like that's sh- like, th- like they don't take care of themselves. They don't do enough strength training. They should start with strength training because mm-hmm. most of the time massage therapists are relatively deconditioned, hypermobile, right? And then they don't get enough self care. Yeah. Right? I mean, and so that's a that's not only is that a personal liability, but that's a professional liability as well. How can you tell your clients to go get something done that you're not doing yourself? There's no credibility yeah. there. It's sort of I sort of liken it to the to the doctor or the nurse you see sure. really smoking outside mm-hmm. the hospital, like which, mm-hmm. I, which I see so from time to time here in my neighborhood. I'm yeah, like, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like so you work with a lot a lot of clients and other practitioners. How do you get people to show up for themselves. How, how, do, you, do you have any ideas about motivating people to take their self-care more seriously and to get into that routine? Well, you have to find what their hot button is. Yeah. Right? I mean, so I work with athletes. That's all. Well, I shouldn't say that's all I work with, but that's a majority of people that I work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I work with athletes that are injured and I help them move better, uh, recover better and perform better. And so if a guy could like, Tuesday, I'm going to start working with a guy um, uh, that has that ha- he's a second round pick for the Mariners, and he's had Tommy John. Um, he's pretty motivated. Yeah, right. Um, sure. He if and if and if I can help him get back to what he wants to be, um, then he's going to follow. And so that's been my experience with athletes. If an athlete comes to you and they're injured. And you can help them get back to the thing that they love to do. They're highly motivated. Yeah. So now let's say you don't like athletes because you don't like crazy psycho people. I get that. <laughs> um, but let's say you, you know, your, your thing is like, I have a, a friend of mine and someone that I've coached in business a little bit. She really loves working with, with pre and postnatal moms. Um, so you have to understand what their hot buttons are going to be. Yeah. What are going to be the things that motivate them? And also you have to recognize that uh, you're, we're dealing with adults. Mm-hmm. And so if you're dealing with adults who are paying you money, it's up to them or not. Yeah. And then also you decide, see the funny thing about it, this is the funny thing about it that I don't understand. There's only, well, there's two people that have the keys to my office. My, my friend that I sell these from and me. I don't give out a key to my clients. 
So I don't know how they can get in the door without me letting them in. Right. So if yeah. you've decided that, that this, that, that, that you don't want to work with clients any longer that don't take their self-care seriously, the only person that's letting them in the door is you. Right. Right. So, I mean, you know, you've got to start to select out the people that you, that you, that you love to work with the clients that are your true fans. Mm. And, and most massage therapists don't do that. So that's a huge factor in burnout because now you're surrounding yourself with a bunch of people. Like you shouldn't look at the clock on Thursday and go, damn, I got seven more hours until the end of Friday. Right. That yeah. shouldn't be the thing that you do, but a lot of people do. Yeah. Right? That's, that's hard. Yeah. I remember getting frustrated early in my career when I would, you know, I, and I was in spa settings, but I would be like, sure. Oh, if you, if you just do these three things, these, these stretches and, and then they would come back next month and they, they did none of it. Sure. <laughs> and then that next time I'd be like, well, if you could just do these two. And then like, by the time I, you know, like six months in, I was just like, I know you're not going to do this, but if you could do this one thing, try that. And then like, yeah. So I, th I think another part of that too is um, how you set up your, your practice and how you decide that you're going to um, lead your clients. Yeah. So for me, when you, you only get to me one way via phone call, you don't get to schedule online with me. Mm. So there's, you can't, I don't care how clever you think you are. You're not going to get into an appointment with me via email. Right. Okay. So if you're a new client, you only get to me one way. We have a phone call. And the reason why for that is, is because I don't want to waste my time. So, you know, like I, I want clients who are going to come in uh, on, on a regular basis until we, we collectively, they and I problem solve their issue out until, and then we talk about, I talk to them about maintenance programs and I tell them you are going to, I'm going to give you one to three pieces of homework at the end of every session. Yeah. So they right? know up front what's going Yeah. On. Because why I'm being a professional for crying out loud. Yeah. Right. I mean, that you, when you go to get your oil changed, they put the sticker on there and they go, hey, look, this is when you should come back so your car doesn't blow up. And what do you do most likely? You go back so your car doesn't blow up, <laughs> right? I mean, because why? Because you're going to see the professional. And so, um, and then I, so I have this really ingenious device for homework. So I'll show it to you. Now it's going to blow your mind because you've never seen this before. You sure. ready? So this is an iPhone. This is a brand new piece of equipment. It's brand new. Everybody's going to love it really soon. Yeah, for sure. And, and did you know that, I mean, this is going to be mind blowing to you as well. I mean, like, like this is incredible. I'm, I'm early adopter of this. There's this thing called a video camera on here that you can film stuff. Yeah, and yeah. You, they, there's technology now that you can send it to people in a text or an email. Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> so what I do at the, at the end of every session, when I see people in, in person, um, they film me doing their homework. Ah, smart. I like that. Now, here's the next thing. The second thing I ask them when they come in, let me see your homework. So they have to so, film themselves doing what you did. Yeah. No, no. They have to show me their homework. Oh, I see. I yeah. See in person. Let me see your homework. Yeah. Even, but even if I'm online, like when I'm seeing clients online, yeah, yeah, yeah. let me see your homework. You know why? Because it takes them back to when I was in third grade and my third grade teacher, Mrs. Weiss said, hey, Sean, let me see your homework. And I'm like, shit, I didn't do it, right? <laughs> so, so what happens then is my clients understand that I'm serious about their homework. Yeah. And also, and if, and if you have someone showing up not doing their homework, you have a conversation about maybe you're not the right practitioner? I, yeah, I've, I fired a guy two years ago. He was, he was in my, my, my office for five minutes, the second session. I just literally mm -hmm. like, hey, man, this isn't going to work for us. Yeah, I don't work. I, I'm not going to charge you for today, but I don't want to waste your time and I don't want to waste my time. So, you know, good luck. Yeah, I think you know? there's definitely a, I think that's a hard thing for a lot of uh, practitioners in the field. This sort of taking ownership of their time and a, a lot of us sort of want to be the therapist for everybody. It's a mistake. It doesn't work. Yeah, no, no. See, and I, see the bonus again with my personality. I, I, uh, that person won't be the first person I've set and won't upset and won't be the last person that I'll upset. Yeah. Right. So like, I mean, I don't care. Right. I mean, cause, cause here's the thing after 20 years and building my practice through a recession, if you've been in practice for the last 10 years, you don't even understand how good the damn economy was. 
Yeah. So, so when, when in 2000, 2016, when the major Ford plant closed 20 miles from my practice and Ford sold the land, think about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Right. So now when everybody is, when everybody now is losing jobs, getting laid off, they're coming in to see me now. And I have to have a reason why they need to come back. Yeah. Cause they don't have money. So they're choosing to spend their money with me. Yeah. Where they might choose to spend it, uh, you know, out to dinner or on a new shirt. Right. Right. And so, so I had to get really, really, really serious about understanding my value to my clients is providing them with outcomes. Yeah. So, and it's also the stories that, I, that they tell, right? Mm -hmm. So the stories that my clients tell about me are my best form of marketing. So if my clients tell, tell the story of like, oh, I went and saw Sean. Yeah, I've been seeing him for 87 weeks, 75 times a week. And I'm, oh yeah, my shoulder's better every 45th session. That's not compelling for someone, yeah, no. right? But when, they, when, I, when I have the guy that had 25 years of, of Achilles pain and, he was, and he's a runner and he always runs with Achilles pain, right? And he, he doesn't, by the way, he's not running 5Ks. He's running like 30 and 50 and 70 mile races. Wow. On, on and off trail, right? He's a psycho, he's a runner. I mean, he's an athlete. We're weirdos. I get it, right? But like when, he, when I get rid of his, his Achilles pain, meaning that he no longer has it pre, post, and during run, he's telling everybody about it. For sure. Right? So that's what I'm doing. I'm providing them with outcomes. So whatever is the outcome that you promise your clients, the, the more that you put steps in place in front of you to, to achieve those outcomes, the more that the, the the more that the story changes about your clients and the way that they believe that you're of value. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So so to round this out, what do you how do you see this whole the shutdown and the the oncoming changes? What is it doing to the massage therapy bodywork field? I think it's a uh, there's it's a it's going to be an interesting thing because I think you're gonna have a you're gonna have two camps. You're going to have a camp that wants regulation and unionization and all of these things, which is really funny to me because massage therapists can't agree on thread count on sheets or <laughs> what type of lotion to use or what Spotify set list is good. Right. Like, sure. yeah. I mean, the, the, it's, it's, it's hilarious to me that that idea is even going to work. And then it's, and, the, and then secondly, um, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of people uh, recognize that our, Wonderful governing bodies don't really have any control over anything, and they've been selling us a bill of lies in the ABMP and the AMTA, which have done really nothing to help us out during this whole entire time, right? Like, you don't see anything like the idea that the AMTA is going to come and tell me that I can't do online sessions. Like, you're going to tell me that I can't do that? Oh, you're not going to cover my life? Like, are you serious? Like, how could you guys not figure this out a different way to help out the industry? And right. so what you're going to see is you're going to see a bunch of massage therapists. They're going to wind up going rogue and they're going to go off and they're going to do other things. They're going to go get personal trainer certification certifications. They're going to get yoga certifications. They're going to get things. They're going to get certifications where there's not a ton of governing body to limit them in when something, if, and when something like this happens again. Yeah. So, and also I think, Again, this is not going to make very many people happy, but I'm okay with it. Um, I, I also think that, um, you know, the market was good. We needed a market correction. Sure. Right? Like, like, there can't be 75 million massage therapists within a two-block radius. The, yeah. the economy cannot support it. And so, you know, and also, hopefully, what I hope happens is it forces massage therapists, myself included, by the way, myself included, so I'm not, I'm not sitting on my, in my ivory tower looking down at everybody. It's forced me to address some really serious liabilities in my practice. Like this has made me take a look at the idea that the only way that I can generate income is from in-person sessions. Right. You know, it's made me really look at that there might not be, an, there might be an indeterminate amount of time that I'm told that I can't work. Man, I need to get my financial shit together. For right? sure. Because yeah. I wasn't set up for tomorrow you can't work and I'm not going to tell you we can get back to work and nobody else was. Yeah. Right. 
So, so, uh, you know, for me, that's been, (laughs) has it been stressful? Sure. It's been stressful, but also it's caused me to adapt and change. So the, the folks that will be able to adapt, change and pivot will make it through this. The people who, you know, want to rely on an unemployment check. I don't know what to tell you. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're in an industry that, that good and bad, you, you have to be highly self-reliant. Mm-hmm. And if you struggle with that, you're going to, you're going to struggle with business anyways, eventually, like that's going to be a problem for you, right? If yeah. you can't answer the problems that are in your practice, that's going to be a hard time. That's going to, that's going to be a struggle for everybody. Yeah. Well, uh, so much to think about. So this, uh, this whole thing will continue to unfold and people can learn about you. Sean Is that. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm on the Facebook and the Instagram, you know, so you can, you know, go on the Facebook and the Instagram and find me. I'd love to chat for a few more minutes off of this sure. recording. And um, thanks again for being on the Massage Hodge podcast. Hey, thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. It was a great really time. I appreciate it. And yeah. uh, everyone listening out there, you can subscribe, find us on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen. And we'll catch you next time. <laughs>